Police are still looking for the gunman who opened fire on a car. Well, investigators are trying to get to the bottom of who is responsible for such a tragedy. Daughter of a man murdered is devastated. The killer has been given a stay of execution. Detroit police released surveillance video after a man is shot and killed. His attorneys are asking for a stay in his execution to allow time for the competency trial. And tonight, detectives are giving us a brand new look at the shooting and the suspects in hopes of getting them behind bars where they belong. Trial and conviction of Coley. David Moore was abducted on December 23rd, 1996, while he was unloading his car trunk. He was approached by two men, Green and Coley, who displayed small caliber semi-auto pistols while in the car. Moore asked for directions, but neither Green nor Coley responded. Moore handed Coley $112 which Coley threw on the front seat. Coley shot Moore in the stomach, then shot him in the head. After a few shots, Moore fell down and felt a bullet hit him in the head. He pretended to be lifeless, but as his assailant walked away, Moore thought that Green, who was heavier and taller than Coley, was the one who had just shot him. Tyrone Armstrong, a cousin of both Coley and Green, saw Coley and Green driving a light blue Ford Taurus. Armstrong identified State Exhibit 32 and 33 as the weapons they had previously carried. Green made up a rap song with the words, I shot him five times and he had dropped. Coley and Green abandoned Moore's Taurus and later found it stolen from a Mercury Topaz. Samar L. Oakdy was found lifeless in an alley on January 7, 1997. El Oakdy had last been seen on January 3, 1997, and police traced her movements from around 5 p.m. until 8 p.m. No evidence firmly established exactly where or when she had been abducted. El Oakdy's boyfriend discovered that El Oakdy was missing and notified the police. Friends and relatives searched for her, hired a private detective, and distributed missing person flyers. Armstrong saw Coley driving a gray Pontiac 6000 that he later identified as El Oakdy's car. Megan Matimo, El Oakdy's friend and co-worker, saw El Oakdy's car drive by, which she identified by its dented rear fender and distinctive bumper sticker. Police staked out the car using five undercover police vehicles. Police are still looking for the gunman who opened fire on a car. Well, investigators are trying to get to the bottom of who is responsible for such a tragedy. Prosecutors say his intentions for the money were sinister. And tonight, detectives are giving us a brand new look at the shooting and the suspects in hopes of getting them behind bars where they belong. In 1997, police found a Pontiac driven by Green, Coley, and a woman with a baby. Despite being surrounded, Green rammed one car and spun his wheels in an attempt to escape. Green and Coley resisted arrest, and police found a loaded pistol in Green's coat and a loaded 25 caliber, brown-handled pistol near Coley. Police found a black crochet purse with LOD's license plates, but never found her red wallet and credit cards. On January 7th, police found LOD's body in an alley behind West Grove Place. The deputy coroner found that El Oki had passed away from a 25 caliber bullet, which was removed from her cerebellum. A firearms expert, David Kogan, examined the bullet, wrist, shell casings, and Coley's semi-auto pistol. Coley and Green were arraigned on charges related to El Oki's stolen Pontiac and stolen plates. On January 16, 1997, a grand jury heard allegations relating to El Oakdy and returned to an indictment of slaying. Coley was re-indicted on March 10, 1997, with an eight-count indictment for the offenses of kidnapping, aggravated robbery, attempted slaying, aggravated slaying, kidnapping, and robbery. Coley pleaded not guilty and was convicted as charged with the jury finding that he was the principal offender in the aggravated slaying and committed the offense with prior calculation and design. The trial court sends Coley to 10 years on each of counts 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 7th, and 8th to be served consecutively.
pre-trial issues. The case revolves around Coley's claim of prejudice due to the pervasive publicity about his case. However, Coley argues that this publicity does not necessarily lead to an unfair trial, as it is a right guaranteed by the jury trial system. Changes in venue help protect fair trial rights, and a trial court may change venue when it appears that a fair and impartial trial cannot be held. Coley's claims of error based on prejudicial pretrial publicity fail for several reasons. First, Coley never moved for a change of venue, thus waiving his right to complain on this basis. Second, the record contains little direct evidence of media interest, articles, or commentary on the trial. Detroit police released surveillance video after a man is shot and killed. Daughter of a man murdered is devastated. The killer has been given a stay of execution. His attorneys are asking for a stay in his execution to allow time for the competency trial. However, the defendant bears the burden to prove prejudice and that the trial court abused its discretion in denying severance. The court upheld the use of similar other acts evidence in comparable cases and the court rejected Coley's first proposition. The court ruled in favor of Coley in a slaying case, stating that the evidence of each crime was separate and distinct, and the jury was not likely to be confused about which evidence proved Coley's attempt to slaying Moore and which proved that he had slayed El Oakty. The court satisfied both tests, either of which was sufficient to negate Coley's claims of prejudice. The trial court provided a limiting instruction to the jury during the guilt phase on the limited use of the more evidence to prove Coley's identity as El Oakty Slayer. The court also instructed the jury in the penalty phase regarding the specific aggravating circumstances that the jury was to consider in imposing punishment for El Oakty's aggravated slaying. Coley never objected to the instructions or claimed confusion about the relevance of the more offenses. Coley argues that the trial court erred in not disclosing grand jury minutes because Coley demonstrated a particularized need for records of those proceedings. However, the court disagrees. Coley recognizes that the grand jury proceedings are secret and an accused is not entitled to inspect grand jury transcripts unless the ends of justice require it and there is a showing by the defense that a particularized need for disclosure exists which outweighs the need for secrecy. The decision to deny release of grand jury testimony is within the discretion of the trial court. Coley argues that he demonstrated a particularized need because the grand jury indicted Coley for the Moore and L. Oak D. offenses in a non-capital indictment issued in January 1997. In March 1997, the prosecutor resubmitted the case and another grand jury issued a capital indictment against Coley. Coley was then tried on those new charges. However, the trial court rejected Coley's argument that a capital indictment had improperly replaced the earlier non-capital indictment. The subsequent capital indictment was based on additional investigation and a new evidence, not on improper motives such as placating a newspaper or police department. Guilty Face Issues Coley, a man found guilty of slaying his mother, Victoria Coley, argued that the sufficiency of evidence to support the jury's finding of prior calculation and design in a slaying case insufficient. The court found Coley guilty of two counts of aggravated slaying based on felony slaying and found him the principal offender in the slaying. Coley argued that his rights against double jeopardy and due process were violated, and he was punished three times for aggravated slaying, again for kidnapping and aggravated robbery, and thus punished various times for one indivisible act. However, the trial court merged the three slaying charges into a single offense, and the trial jury verdict referred to one ending penalty. Coley argued that the trial court erred in admitting gruesome photographs of the victim but the court admitted five crime scene photos of L.O.D.'s body and one autopsy photo without objection. The court has found no abuse of discretion in other cases involving even more gruesome photographs 
and has never objected at the trial or to the photos introduced at the penalty phase. In the propositions 3rd, 6th, 7th, and 9th, Coley argued that the trial court's guilt phase jury instructions contained various deficiencies. However, the court failed to object at trial or request specific instructions and thus waived all but plain error. The court has previously rejected several arguments related to the use of the term guilt or innocence in aggravated slaying cases as a single instruction to a jury may not be judged in artificial isolation but must be viewed in the context of the overall charge. The court challenged the guilt phase reasonable doubt instruction, which incorporated the statutory definition of RC 2901.05. Coley argued that his constitutional rights were violated when the legal issue of relevance was left to the jury regarding sentencing considerations. However, the trial court focused the jury's attention in the sentencing phase, admitting only 11 exhibits from the guilt phase into the penalty phase. The significance to be given the evidence or exhibits was a matter for the jury. In this case, Coley's defense presented evidence about his parents and the family's instability, including his father, Douglas Bell, who served six or seven prison terms and was involved in drug trafficking. The defense presented evidence about Coley's mother's mental health, including her mental illness and her relationship with her brother, Willie Louis Austin. The ending penalty imposed against Coley is appropriate and proportionate when compared with other aggravated slayings involving either kidnapping or aggravated robbery. His ending date has been set for September 24, 2025. That's all for this video, folks. See you next time.